I'm here with uh, Andy Brown and Brian Lindstrom, directors of Los Angel, the genius of Judy Still. And we've talked before uh, a couple months ago, and this is finally starting to uh, get a, a release. I guess we'll just say April 12th in New York, Los Angeles, Portland, Santa Fe, San Francisco, and Calicoon, New York, and then April 22nd in Nashville. You guys mentioned before that it's been a long process getting this movie made. And when I talked to you last, it, it was done. Has there been any like uh, changes or like you just at some point you just got to put your hands up, go. I really want to touch this part, but I got to walk away. Yeah, I mean, we could have kept interviewing. There were other people probably that we would have liked to have gotten, but it was time. We spent 10 years pretty much, not nonstop, but, you know, consistently working on this. And it was, it was, we were ready. And then once it premiered at Doc NYC, then that's, that was basically it. Did we make any, maybe some, a few small changes with photos and stuff? Yeah, minor things about archival footage and stuff, but the film is essentially the same. Yeah. Yeah. What's it like walking away from a documentary after spending so much time on it? Because, like, you know, you spend so much time trying to trying to make it and adjusting it and then putting it down seems to be a lot like it would be a lot more difficult than a spin and say a year making a documentary or a year making a movie. It is. But what's interesting is uh, we're still working on it now. Just the work changes. Now the work is to get it out there in the world and make sure people see it, you know, which kind of requires a whole different skill set <laughs> and different parts of our personalities. Um, and by the way, it's going to be available on Apple TV and Amazon April 12th. Oh, nice. That's a good way of putting it. I mean, also it's, it's that, it's going to be, it's sort of, there's this big unknown of what people will think about it and what, you know, how it will, will affect Judy fans, especially. We're lucky that the, at least from the Facebook group of Judy, they all seem to have liked it. And we're, we're very relieved by that, I'd say, and grateful. But, you know, that was a nice threshold, you know, to have met, I'd say, you know, that Judy fans seem to like the film. So. And We're Judy, fans, so you know, I like the film. Uh, Judy fans tend to be very intense, as JD Souther says in the film. People who like Judy Sill really like Judy Sill, <laughs> they're very demanding. Yeah, Judy is also very forthcoming in this. I'm assuming that's actually her voice and not someone reading, or is it someone reading her writing? Both, it's much of the stuff about her childhood and becoming a you know, the the journey to become a singer-songwriter is Judy's voice because we found a uh, hour-long interview she gave in 1972 with a journalist named Chris Van Ness with the LA Star. And this the parts that are from 73 to 79 were from her journals. And that was a voice actress named Sonia Gotti who uh, um, performed as Judy, channeled Judy, when she recorded the voiceover and did a wonderful job. Well, what was interesting is when Sonia did that, we we just thought it was going to be a scratch track and that we'd eventually find like a voice actress to listen to Judy and imitate her. And the more we listened to it, Sonia just did such a great job that we kept it in because we couldn't imagine anyone doing it better. Sonia was deeply affected by doing that voiceover. Just as a favor to us, she did it in her bathtub with a glass of wine and a Tascam recorder channeling Judy with the voiceover that we provided for her. And she did just a wonderful job. And we kept it in there. It stayed in from the, you know, all the way through. What What are some uh, aspects of the, of Judy's story that probably made the cutting room floor that like you, you would have liked to put in the, the documentary, but it just didn't fit. And sometimes you got to, you know, kill your babies and some stuff just doesn't work. First thing that leaps to my mind is uh, there's a wonderful man, Bill Bodicher, um, who went to L.A. Valley Community College with Judy, and he was in the music department with her. And he recorded a song she performed in the college's uh, songwriting competition. And L.A. Valley College was like a hotbed of musicians. So there were like a lot of studio musicians in, in L.A. who took classes there. So the competition was high and Judy won. And... Uh, we just couldn't fit that story into the film, no matter how much we tried. And, you know, we knew we needed to keep the film to about 90 minutes. So there were some very hard choices we had to make. And 
unfortunately, Bill was one of the people who did make it into the film. Yeah, I concur. I mean, that was the first her first attempt at writing music, and she wrote a song, and it won the fest the the contest at her college. So it was an early sign of her talent. But and the the song is in there, but the story isn't. Uh, yeah, and what's interesting is uh, just two notes into that song, and you know it's Judy Sill. <laughs> I mean, she, she's just sure. there. So, is there any uh, any chance of like any of that deleted footage or anything making it to DVD or special features or anything like that? Because I think with documentaries, especially, a lot of opportunity to maybe do that. At, at least with physical wonderful. media, I, I, no I don't plan. know how that I don't know how that works with uh, streaming. I, I don't either. I mean, it would be more a DVD Blu-ray kind of thing, but I think that would be, well, wait, wait for the Criterion uh, release for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it would be great. There's a lot of very good stuff. It's true. Yeah. And what, what are some, uh, are, are you guys still like full on with finishing a Los Angel release or are you guys working on something else that's uh, another nine, 10 years in the making? <laughs> I probably am down here in New Orleans. It's I tell my son, it's like, I may die, and then you'll get hundreds of external hard drives of footage, and you'll have to figure out what to do with what I'm doing down here. So, which is trying to make a doc about a music club in the in a neighborhood here, Brian. And I'm uh, working on a film about formerly incarcerated uh, moms and their children, and how uh, they're navigating life on the outside. Oh wow. How close is that one to being completed? Well, it's interesting. It's a follow-up to a film I made in 2014 called Mothering Inside, um, which was all about the moms in prison and their kids coming to visit them. And now this expanded film I'm I'm doing is much more about the kind of healing ripples of uh, what happens when incarcerated moms are giving the resources they need to kind of heal themselves and their families. So like with uh, Los Angel, like what are some lessons you've learned here that's helping you move forward with future documentaries or movies? Oh, that's a great question. I, I think one thing we found out is, uh, or we, we keep finding out is that films have their own life, you know, and they're like children. They're going <laughs> to, they're going to dictate how things go and how long they are. And you kind of have to, you know, be along for the ride and be open to wherever the journey's taking you. Like there were many times when we, you know, maybe thought we wanted to be done with a film, but if we had ended the film, then we wouldn't have fleet foxes in it, for instance. You know, it's like you have and to be and also be open to what your collaborators' ideas are and and try them, try yeah. everything, yeah. and that's partly why it takes a long time as well. If you want to get it right, you have to try all the ideas, and that just takes time. Yeah. It's a pretty methodical process, and I learned a lot about how valuable that is and honoring that. So you have to respect each other's ideas, even if you don't think they're good at first, because I was wrong so many times about things. I said, ah, I don't think that'll work. And then I see it and I was like, oh yeah, that's good. So, you know, I that was a good lesson to learn. Also, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about the uh, the animation in this. Who did the animation? How did that come about? At least it looks like bits of her diary. I don't know if those are actually yes. photo scans of her diary animated. It is. It is. So the, the, we were faced with the challenge of there being very little archival footage of Judy, very little filmed footage. We added very little to what existed. So we need, knew we needed to come up with a visual element. Luckily, in the journals, she had an art journal. She had doodles. We were able to use a lot of that in the film and then create a animation style based on the aesthetic of that, of Judy's style, so that she is sort of as if she's animating the film, she's telling her own story in the voiceover. We're using stems from her second album, Heart Food, to as if she's scoring the film. That was really our goal was to get it in her voice as much as possible. But it had a lot to do with us not having a, a big archive that we could find and avail ourselves of. And I just want to give a shout out to our illustrator, Mia Nolting, who made those drawings kind of using Judy's style as her guide. And then our wonderful animator, um, Sam Neiman, who then animated those images. They were both really crucial to this film. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it looked pretty great. Um, so uh, yeah, congratulations to them. So I, I didn't get to ask you guys this last time. Cause I wasn't, I don't think I was doing it then, but I'll ask you now. Uh, Cause mm. we have a, what's in the box segment. And mm -hmm. in the box, we have people put movies, and these are movies that are either personal to you or, uh, like, that movie's really good and no one talks about it. And then each week, we'll pull a movie out of the box 
and then watch it for the following week. So what's a movie each of you would like to put in the box? Not necessarily a music doc. Can be just any any old film? No, it can be anything. Hmm. I'll say On the Bowery. <laughs> directed by Lana Bregosen. It's uh, a... Oh, you, you cut out. What was that last part? Uh, On the Bowery from 1956, directed by Lionel Rogozin. And okay. it's a kind of wonderful documentary narrative hybrid where he and his crew went out to the Bowery, um, you know, with their huge camera. At that point, the cameras were just monstrous um, and used people on the Bowery uh, as actors and I think uh, collaborators to to make a story in a film. And it's really a kind of wonderful slice of life. Wow, this is, I don't even know where to start, but I'm just going to, last night I watched for the first time in 30 plus years, uh, The Thin Blue Line, Daryl Morris film. Oh. And which was so influential at the time it came out with all those beautiful reenactments he did. And and it just holds up really, really well. It's it's kind of the, quick. It's, it's one of the first true crime in the true crime drama genre that everyone loves now. And if people haven't seen it, it's worth checking out, I'd say. Just just because I watched it last night, that's what I'm going to go with. All right. Cool. Well, yeah, everyone uh, should check out A Lost Angel, The Genius of Judy Sill on April 12th. Uh, uh, it's playing in select theaters. I forget you said Amazon streaming. Amazon. And Apple. Yeah. And Apple TV, yeah. Okay, streaming on Amazon and Apple TV. And yeah, this is uh, a fun documentary. And of course, like I mentioned last time, I wasn't familiar with Judy Sill. So this is pretty eye opening to me. So yeah, congratulations and hope it does well. Thank Thanks you, so Eric. much, Eric. Good to see oh, you again. Yeah.